Um, so hello everyone, welcome to this evening's webinar on inflammatory arthritis in young adults. My name is Jess, I'm from Arthritis Queensland, New South Wales, and I'm very excited to have Dr. Amy Kelly here to present this webinar. Um, so Dr. Amy Kelly is a consultant rheumatologist and staff specialist at Campbelltown and Camden Hospital. Uh, Amy completed her rheumatology training at Concord, Campbelltown and Liverpool hospitals and has developed experience in a variety of general rheumatological conditions. Amy has developed specific interest in paediatric rheumatology and in 2017 completed a year of paediatric training um, with Dr. Uh, Professor Devinda Singh Gruel and Dr. Jeffrey Ch Ch Chaito, um, paediatric rheumatologist with the Sydney Children's Hospital Network. Amy has also um, is also currently completing a PhD through the University of Sydney on juvenile and, and you may correct me, Amy, dermatomyositis. Dermatomyositis, that's right, yeah. Um, so Amy consults privately in regional New South Wales and in 2003 established a paediatric rheumatology clinic at Campbelltown Hospital and continues to see both adult and paediatric patients in private practice. Um, so I will hand it over to you, Amy, and, and feel free to um, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Jess. Um, all right, I'll just share my screen. All right. Can everyone see that? I hope so. Yes. Um, technology is not my strong point. Um, <clears throat> all right. And I'll just reduce that. All right. So, look, Jess, thank you. And thank you, um, Arthritis New South Wales and Queensland, for asking me to speak tonight. Um, as Jess introduced myself, um, I am a rheumatologist. Uh, I'm trained in adult rheumatology. But I did do a final year um, with my rheumatology training in paediatric rheumatology and my PhD, which I'm sort of slowly uh, um, tipping through, uh, is actually in paediatric rheumatology and more specifically focusing predominantly on juvenile dermatomyositis, which is a rare childhood connective tissue disease. Um, I am a staff specialist at Campbelltown and Camden Hospital in southwest Sydney. Um, I have uh, multiple adult clinics that I run there, and I also um, established a paediatric rheumatology clinic there in early 2023. Um, and I also, I live regionally in regional New South Wales, and I also run a private consulting uh, rheumatology service in southwest New South Wales, in which I see adult and paediatric patients as well. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. And as Jess said, please feel free to ask any questions as we go along. I'll do my best to answer some of them as we go. Um, otherwise, uh, we can leave them for the end. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> so I guess, um, you know, when I was first asked to do this, I was thinking, oh, okay, you know, um, lots to cover here. It's a big topic. Um, there's lots of facets to what we're going to talk about tonight um, and you know I, I so obviously I can't sort of go into a huge amount of detail with it but I'm happy to answer any questions um, via email at a later date or at the end of the um, presentation. So we're going to talk specifically um, about medications currently, treatment options in 2024, um, then we're going to move on to talking specifically more about um, uh, sex, contraception and family planning. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll also touch on briefly transition services in adult rheumatology um, and in paediatric rheumatology and smoothing that transition from being a paediatric patient to an adult patient. And then we'll briefly summarise and talk about some ongoing challenges um, and how I think that can best be addressed. All right. So just briefly, um, I'm going to talk predominantly here about juvenile um, arthritis or JRA, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, but I certainly recognise that as consumers or patients, um, you may have a variety of different diagnoses, so I'm not, you know, so this is sort of a way to sort of focus in on some of the key issues, but I'm certainly very understanding that other people will have other diagnoses or know of other pe people who have different diagnoses. So uh, just as a background for JIA, um, there are uh, a number of, 
five classification subtypes of JIA. They are oligoarticular, which tends to be um, one, two, less than four joints involved, polyarticular, which is more joints um, than that, essentially, and if enthesitis related arthritis, um, which tends to affect uh, predominantly the entheses, which is the tissue of the tendon that can attach to the bones. Um, systemic juvenile um, arthritis, which is, um, I guess, we sort of think about it in a slightly different way and it can have slightly different presentation. And then undifferentiated JIA, so the one that we're probably not, not quite sure or we're reluctant to put a label on. Now, under understanding those subtypes can be important because it can influence the treatment options, um, the treatments that we know are um, efficacious or effective in that particular subtype. And also it can help influence um, how we think your disease is going to progress. So what is the likelihood of it persisting into adulthood? Um, each subtype, as I've said, may behave quite differently and require those different treatments. And sometimes we use autoantibodies um, to determine risk for particular, uh, I guess, disease presentations or flares. And also, again, the likelihood of that joint disease is going to persist into adulthood. Oh, sorry, wrong one. There we go. All right. So what is the treatment like uh, for juvenile arthritis and indeed, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory arthritis in 2024? Well, the reality is it's actually as good as it has ever been. So, you know, I think, um, you know, decades ago and certainly, you know, more than 40, 50 years ago, our patients, you know, a JIA or a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis was, to be frank, quite a grim diagnosis. Um, you know, people developed terrible deformities, there was multi-organ involvement, um, and it had a significant impact on your life. Um, currently, uh, we just don't see those, um, those severe outcomes happening as frequently as we used to. So, and I've probably noticed even this, you know, in my um, career over the last, you know, 10 years or so, um, that, you know, the treatment landscape has really improved dramatically the outcomes for our patients. So we're really not seeing those severe outcomes and it's actually a really positive thing. And in fact, you know, a lot in, often in adult rheumatology, we'll, you know, we'll say to our patients who come in with osteoarthritis, look, I'm really sorry, but, you know, you'd almost be better off if you're diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis because the treatments I can offer you are perhaps more effective than what I can offer you for osteoarthritis. So when we talk about treatments, and I talk again specifically about juvenile arthritis, first-line treatments are steroid joint injections. So I'm not sure what your experience or knowledge of the treatments are, but certainly joint injections with steroid in children is first-line treatment, as well as anti-inflammatories also. And that's sort of the beginning of the treatment um, blocks, I guess, that we gradually build on if we're not able to push that joint disease into remission. And then you may be aware that we then, um, if, if there's multiple joints involved, that it's so it's not feasible to inject that many joints, um, or we're not getting good control or other um, symptoms are developing, such as eye involvement, then that's when we may have to introduce what we, we um, call DMARDs or disease modifying agents. And these can range from, you, you, certainly, I guess, probably the most common DMARD we would use in both pediatric and adult rheumatology would be methotrexate. We can use that in an oral form or a subcutaneous form. We may or may not do that for various reasons, for ease of administration or um, to reduce side effects. And then other DMARDs such as sulfazalazine you may be familiar with as well and probably less common in paediatrics, um, leflunamide. There are some others that are less common, um, but certainly when we're talking predominantly about JIA and I'm talking probably about a typical presentation of either oligoarticular or polyarticular JIA, then, you know, methotrexate, um, lafunamide less commonly and sulfazalazine less commonly as sort of our dominant DMARDs that we use. Um, and then if we get to the point where the disease is not responding to those treatments, then we move on to more targeted therapies, 
And you may have heard the concept of biologics or biological DMARDs. Um, increasingly also in JIA, there is targeted synthetic DMARDs. So that's the TS DMARDs or the B DMARDs. And these are what we call highly specialized targeted immune therapy. So they target a specific part of the immune system that have been shown in studies to reduce the activity and the inflammation associated with these joint diseases. Generally speaking, these medications are very expensive. They can cost you know, anywhere between ten dollars to $30,000 a year per patient. The government is uh, generally happy to pay for that, but you have to meet certain criteria. So it has to be prescribed by a rheumatologist um, and you have to be reviewed with, um, within uh, usually a, a three to six month period and at the very least 12 months. And, and often, although the landscape has changed in the last couple of months, um, the initial treatments we need to send off applications for, but moving down the track and increasingly, which is good news for us and for our patients, um, we're able to provide um, streamlined authority prescriptions for those now, um, which has made a big difference. But they're a little bit, um, you know, it's not something that we can generally prescribe off the bat, um, and the routine would be that it has to be an application to Medicare. So um, lots of treatments available. There are various graded steps in our treatment, and it really depends on how your disease is progressing, um, how active it is, and how refractory it may be to our first-line treatments. But certainly things are looking good for treatment of JIA in 24, 2024. All right. So what are some of the issues with the treatments? And I think when I talk about issues, I'm talking specifically about issues for young people and those people that are in their teenage years, adolescent years, and moving into young adulthood. Okay. So as you may know, if you've been prescribed any of these treatments or you know someone who has, they can take a long time to take effect. So generally speaking, these medications won't work in a day or two, okay? So it's not like a painkiller like Panadol or even Nurofen, for example, for a headache. Um, it can take weeks, if not months, to have a full effect. So, and often our reviews and the frequency of our reviews are based around how long we're going to see an impact of that particular treatment, okay? Um, often they may have quite tricky um, regime. So you might be getting a tablet once a week um, with another tablet followed the day after pre to prevent side effects. Um, you may have to receive injections once a fortnight, once a week, once a month. Um, there are quite different regimes, which when you're busy at school or studying for exams or at university or trying to hold down a job or indeed moving all over the place because you're a young person and you've got a new job or you're moving to a different university or a different TAFE or whatever you're, you're doing, it can really be quite an impact on um, uh, trying to remember these sort of sometimes tricky regimes with medications. All right. The other issue we have with some of these is obviously side effects. So, you know, in some people they will experience side effects. There are some side effects that, you know, um, that are quite, that, well, very uncommon. They're very unlikely to happen. Um, but unfortunately, there are some side effects associated with these medications. And sometimes that can be hard. And we might sometimes see these side effects with the initial few weeks of treatment that generally dissipate over time. And sometimes they don't. So all these things can impact on a young person's ability to remember, to want to take the drug. Um, and therefore um, to assess if it's actually helping their joint disease. <clears throat> we know that um, uh, it's really important that we push the joint disease into remission. And we know that it's really important to do that as early as we can in the disease course, okay? So when we make a diagnosis of JAA or even in a young adult, rheumatoid arthritis, we're really focused on getting the patient or the consumer onto the most effective drug treatment as soon as possible, okay? And then we're wanting to maintain that remission as well. And often we will be asked, well, how long do I need to be on this medication? And 
The short answer is that it's quite controversial and it's um, open for debate as to how long each specific subtype of JAA or uh, joint disease will need to be treated, okay? And so often as a rheumatologist, and certainly I do, you know, we sort of go by our feel, okay? So if I see someone present with really florid disease, I'm probably going to say to them, look, I really want to see you really stable with no changes on your bloods and no clinical detection of act act uh, active inflammation in your joints, probably for anywhere between 18 and two years, before I want to start winding back some of your treatment, okay? Now, some other rheumatologists would argue with me, oh, well, that's, you know, I'd probably do it at six months. Well, that's fine. So the short answer is there's no clear answer. And, and guidelines are, um, are sort of currently being developed around this issue. Um, but I think the take-home message here is that we need to try and push a joint disease into remission as soon as possible. All right. And then often we get asked, well, should we be concerned about these long-term side effects? So a lot of these medications are, you know, targeting parts of the immune system. We know that the immune system is important to regulate other body functions, like um, uh, uh, obviously infections um, and some cancers. And, and so should we be worried about starting these medications in children and or indeed young adults and if so, how long are they going to be on these medications? Again, the data looks pretty good that we don't see um, predominantly higher rates of cancer um, in these in patients, generally speaking, with these medications. However, obviously, a lot of these new targeted um, immune therapies are only new, so it's a it's a moving space. Okay, and we're constantly re-evaluating data and looking at long-term side effects for a lot of these medications. I think also it's important to remember that if you have active arthritis, active inflammatory arthritis, I should say, we know that you're at increased risk of other systemic problems. And when I say systemic problems, I mean effects on other organs. So hearts, blood vessel, kidneys, um, uh, it can increase your risk, certainly, of infection. So active joint disease predisposes you to infection. We think certainly in adults it probably predisposes to some type of cancers as well, possibly blood clots. And down the track, and even though as a young adult it's often hard to comprehend this, we think also if your joint disease is active, it probably increases your risk of heart attack and stroke, probably to the similar level as a diabetic. Okay, which if you are aware, you know, diabetes does certainly contribute to a risk for cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. So all those reasons um, suggest that we need to treat disease early and aggressively, but I understand and we all understand it is not always easy. So our medications have side effects, um, we need to manage those side effects. They can be difficult to take and remember to take on time, and they can also take weeks to months to uh, kick in. So often in, um, certainly in the paediatric clinic that I run, parents will sit down and they'll say, well, so, you know, is my 12-year-old daughter going to have this until she's, you know, 70, 80, is it ever going to go away? Is she going to be on these medications forever? Well, we don't, it's not always easy to predict. There perhaps are some subtypes that will suggest that it will persist into adult, but overall we think about 30 to 50% of children will have juvenile arthritis that persists into adulthood, okay? And the likelihood of long-term disability is related to how well we control the disease, okay? So if I said previously, early, more aggressive treatment has much better outcomes, all right? So I think it's important to give you, to empower you as a consumer or a patient or your child that you understand what type of JIA you do have when we're specifically talking about JIA and have an understanding about where this might go and ask your rheumatologist, okay? So ask them what they think is the likelihood of you going into remission. And when I mean remission, and I guess when we talk about remission, we often think, oh, God, that sounds like cancer or something. We talk about remission as dampening down of the inflammation into the joint so that we can't detect it when we examine you 
And that's also demonstrated on blood tests as well. Okay. All right. So then it gets tricky. So you've been diagnosed with juvenile arthritis as, as a um, child. Um, transitioning then, it particularly if your joint disease is persisting into adulthood, can be really hard, okay? Um, I'm certainly very conscious. So I have a paediatric clinic at Campbelltown Hospital and I have an adult rheumatology clinic at Camden Hospital. Unfortunately, and this is not a criticism of my colleagues or their patients, but my adult clinic runs at the same time as a respiratory clinic. And the respiratory clinic is full of people who have smoked for decades. They're often in a wheelchair attached to home oxygen um, or they have other chronic lung diseases and they're coughing and spluttering everywhere. Um, they're usually quite um, skinny and malnourished and it's not a very attractive clinic for a young person to walk into when they've been in the beautiful paediatric ward with all the pretty pictures on the walls, the clowns running around everywhere, and even all the nurses are dressed in bright colours. So, um, so I get that it's not easy. It's quite a shock. It can be quite confronting as to who you're sitting next to in the waiting room. Um, I think, you know, when you're 16, 17, 18 plus um, and you're sitting next to a 90-year-old or a 95-year-old, it's often hard to, you know, to get your head around, well, hang on a minute, I don't look like them. I don't feel like them. What the hell am I doing here? So we get that, okay, and I get that. Um, adult doctors sometimes are not as, how do I say, not as friendly, I suppose, but, um, and certainly um, when patients, paediatric patients come and see me in the adult clinic, a lot of all my trainees are adult trainees. So they, some of them may never have done paediatrics at all um, uh, as, as junior doctors. Um, the last time they did pedi paediatrics might have been at medical school and that might have been more than five years ago. So, you know, um, we, we address this as best we can. So I think, um, I think we as a profession need to understand that, you know, we need to adjust how we behave and how we interact with our patients depending on their age and where they come from and what their previous experience of their health um, healthcare has been. The buildings often, unfortunately, for adult medicine are not as nice, okay? So governments seem to push a lot more money into um, paediatric buildings so everything looks nicer, cleaner, brand new, um, whereas certainly my Camden Clinic, it's a much older building, it's dark, there are no windows, you can't see outside. Um, services, unfortunately, also may be more limited. So um, I find, you know, um, Sydney Children's Network um, has, you know, uh, great support with allied health. Um, and, and I think this is an important point as well. Often with JIA, we might find that by the time the patients are moving into an adult clinic, they have burnt out disease. So you might have chronic um, bony changes. So it's what we would call secondary osteoarthritis, where the inflammation has been treated. You may or may not be on any more medication, but you're left with the mechanical issues in the joints that may require, for example, physiotherapy um, or even occupational therapy. And it can often be really hard to um, get those services in adult land. Certainly in my experience, I find that the paediatric um, system is, is better set up for, for managing that and understanding, again, young people. Physios are great and fantastic, but they don't often see young people who have had um, JIA, who now have secondary osteoarthritis in both ankle joints, for example, um, they may be used, more used to seeing, you know, a morbidly obese, uh, you know, 60 plus year old man whose ankles are just quite frankly worn out. Um, so I think allied health services are often limited and that can be challenging as well. I also get that, you know, you may have seen your paediatric rheumatologist since you were two um, and, you know, they become part of your life. You have a great relationship with them. They've almost, you know, they know all of your family. They know everything about you. They know how you were at school. They know what you sport you liked. Um, they know why you chose to do whatever course you're studying now. Um, and they know about your parents. They know about your siblings. They've seen your whole family grow up. Um, and so it can be really hard leaving behind those long-term friendships as well. 
Um, and so, you know, I recognize that. And I also understand that, you know, often I will find myself in a situation where if I'm seeing a pa pediatric patient who's trans transitioning um, to adult rheumatology, that, you know, I will never come close to their pediatric rheumatologist. So their pediatric rheumatologist made the diagnosis and I'm just picking up the ball now and running with it. So I get that as well. So transition medicine is hard and challenging. Um, and that's why I think increasingly we're recognizing the need that in our children with chronic illness um, and who require ongoing chronic disease management, that transition services are really important. So now tertiary centres, and certainly across New South Wales, I can't talk about other, um, other states, um, they have transition nurses and care teams. So that sometimes will involve um, a medical um, doctor, uh, certainly transition nurses, um, and other services if they're, re they're required. And those care teams will generally um, uh, identify patients that are ready to transition, okay? When I say uh, transition, it's a loaded word now because transition, if people think about transitioning gender, so I'm talking now about moving from paediatric to adult medical services. So this process can start as early as 14 and often we have a brilliant transition nurse at Campbelltown Hospital who works across other disciplines. So she's also involved with children with diabetes in particular, as well as rheumatology. And she will contact me um, every, uh, every month or so and we'll go through the, the clinic list and we'll identify those children that uh, are going to need transition services. So we will pick out the people that are, you know, sort of 14 or above. Um, and that may depend. So, you know, I mean, some 14-year-olds are like 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds. Um, some 14-year-olds uh, can appear or be um, perhaps a little bit more emotionally less developed or socially less developed. So we won't sort of go there yet. So it's quite a nuanced thing. Um, but those services and that support structure can continue until you're 25. Okay. So, and I think that's really helpful. We find, interestingly, you know, and certainly my experience has been since we've set up the clinic at Campbelltown that, you know, it's not too many issues with kids 14 to 18. It seems to be when they're, and perhaps even, you know, really to 21, it's when they fly the coop. So it's when uni, study, social life, everything really takes off or, um, or they move out of home or they've had to move away from home or their other support networks at home, that that's where we can run into trouble with keeping up to date with your appointments, managing medications um, and, and, you know, having blood tests and all those things that we, we need to keep a close eye on to most, um, uh, I guess, appropriately manage the joint disease. The Sydney Children's Hospital Network has um, a group called Trapeze. Um, they're excellent. Um, there are other, um, uh, other transition services certainly across the state and most hos large hospitals will have a transition nurse at the very least. Um, but it's really important that if you have any questions about transition medical service, because they're quite varied and different across LHDs, that you talk to your paediatric rheumatologist um, for details about that. So um, as you know, um, you know, uh, paediatric rheumatologists are like unicorns. There's not many of them um, across Australia and certainly in New South Wales. Um, relatively to population size, adult rheumatologists are increasingly also like unicorns as well. So I understand that it may be difficult to contact them. Um, <clears throat> and you indeed, you may also be more in the private sector as well. So you don't have those support networks that they have at the large um, uh, tertiary centres. So again, talk to your rheumatologist. And they're, you know, these transition um, teams are usually very amenable to at least talking over the phone and the rheumatologist can get in contact with them and, and provide details to, for you. Um, all right. So um, I guess uh, adolescence, um, early adulthood, as we as I've started to allude to, um, is an exciting time. It's a it's a ch time of great change in your life. 
Um, but it's really a time where you're stretching your wings and you're really working out who you are, who you want to be and where you want to go with your life. And there's no reason these days why JAA or indeed any um, inflammatory joint disease usually, so I'll say this usually or generally speaking, can't interrupt that exciting time, okay? And we need to recognise as parents of kids with um, juvenile arthritis and as treating doctors of kids with juvenile arthritis that these kids grow up and they grow up to be young adults and they will be encountering all these things in their future and we need to help them manage it as effectively as, as we can. And indeed, not only are we, um, you know, our patients um, will often be transitioning or if, if there's been difficulties controlling the disease, they may have, you know, quite complex drug regimes, complex requirements for management of their joint disease. And this is all happening at the same time as they're doing their HSC or they're um, having a boyfriend or a girlfriend for the first time, they're becoming sexually active. So there's all this stuff going on. So, you know, I think certainly I recognise and um, all my colleagues recognise that, you know, it's completely normal that these children or these young adults may be wanting to be sexually active. They're going to drink alcohol and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, they're probably going to try smoking or certainly more in, uh, uh, today vaping um, and they may even be trying, trying illicit drugs. Um, and at the same time, they're wanting to do all this, they're potentially taking, you know, some pretty serious medications to manage their joint disease. So we need to think about how we can maintain the lines of communication, um, recognise also that we're not there to judge, that we've all been there, okay? We've all been kids, we've all been teenagers, we all know about risky behaviours. Um, and in fact, lots of us, you know, even know that, you know, the brain's just wired differently and it's thinking differently. And there are parts of a young brain that just haven't been switched on yet. And that's not a criticism or that's not sort of dismissing saying that this is all because you're not thinking properly. It's all completely normal um, and completely appropriate. We just need to manage it as smoothly as possible. All right, so did you know, so I looked up some of these statistics um, earlier this week and I thought they were quite interesting and somewhat astounding, but 40% of all pregnancies in Australia are not planned. Um, and that means that an unplanned pregnancy will affect about a third of women in Australia in their lifetime. Interestingly, also, unintended pregnancies are not always a consequence of sex without contraception, okay? And of those unintended pregnancies um, who were taking contraception, 74% of those were on the oral contraceptive pill, okay? Which I found extraordinary, but I suppose not surprising, again, when you're having to remember a tablet every day. Um, Almost half of the women who experienced an unintended, yeah, as I said, sorry, I said that unintended pregnancy were using contraception and young women. So young women, so our patients under the age of 25 were more likely to have an unintended, unintended pregnancy than women over the age of 25. And I don't need to explain to everyone that unintended pregnancies, particularly in young women, particularly indeed in teenage years or early 20s, can have significant social, physical, and probably in JRA also, potentially, if you have, you know, um, difficult to control disease, it can have um, significant health effects as well. I'll just check the chat. Um, <clears throat> there's a question there. Okay, all right, so I might leave that one um, to the end if that's all right, Sandra. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so why are we worried about our JAA patients and contraception and falling pregnant or having an un? We're not worried about them falling pregnant, but we're worried about them having an unintended pregnancy. First and foremost, some medications that we prescribe, in fact, quite a few of them, should not be taken in pregnancy. Okay. So... Um, uh, certainly methotrexate, for example, 
Um, it is contraindicated or it's not to be taken during pregnancy or indeed if you're wanting to fall pregnant. Um, if you fall pregnant, you need to stop it immediately. And the reason is, is that um, some of these medications, including methotrexate, can cause um, potential fetal abnormalities, so problems with the baby. Um, <clears throat> they can also cause spontaneous miscarriage as well. So we like to avoid that, obviously, and that's why we recommend that all our patients um, who are of childbearing years and are sexually active, that they have some form of reliable contraception. And I'll talk a little bit more about that down the track. If you do fall pregnant, it's not, oh, my God, my baby's going to have two heads. It means that first you stop the medication after you've discussed it immediately with your rheumatologist and you may require closer monitoring during your pregnancy. Okay, so for methotrexate, for example, my practice and my practice and my colleagues is that you're referred to a fetal medicine unit for close monitoring for any um, uh, um, issues that may arise with the pregnancy. As I've said, methotrexate, for example, will confer usually a higher rate of spontaneous miscarriage, okay? And as I've also said, to make very clear, if you do fall pregnant, methotrexate, you should stop immediately and inform your rheumatologist. Um, if you fall pregnant and you're on other medications, generally speaking, most rheumatologists should talk about this. I'll talk about this in a few slides ahead, but um, other medications, you also should contact your rheumatologist immediately as well, okay? Sometimes we worry about um, medications in pregnancy like um, anti-inflammatories, so they're not recommended in the first and third trimesters. Um, I think, you know, these days we would tend to avoid all anti-inflammatories, including things like ibuprofen or nurofen, throughout pregnancy because there is higher rates of complications. That's not to say that it's all doom and gloom and that, oh, my goodness, you can't have a baby if you have juvenile arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. You absolutely can, and there are lots of medications that are safe, and your rheumatologist is very well practised in managing women um, throughout their pregnancies who have rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile arthritis, okay? So that it is not an absolute no-no. So um, we have um, lots of ways of um, getting around uh, treatment interactions in pregnancy. You just must talk to your rheumatologist, okay? So if it happens or even if you suspect you may be pregnant, so don't wait for a pregnancy test, communicate. Communicate with your rheumatologist and your treating team and they'll let you know need to know they'll let you know what you need to do with your medications. All right. So as I said, why is contraception important in juvenile arthritis? Okay, as I've said, many of the drugs are not safe. Okay, so hormonal treatments are the best. Okay, so they're the most reliable, but remember, they don't protect against sexually transmitted infections and if um, uh, risky sexual behaviours potentially, so um, uh, with more casual partners potentially or not using any barrier con contraception can increase your risk of infections, which may actually be worse if you are taking immune suppressant medications, all right? So um, it's really important to think about if I'm on methotrexate, I'm sexually active, um, I'm going to have some form of hormonal contraception but at the same time, if I'm worried about sexually transmitted infections, I also need to be using some form of barrier contraception as well. <clears throat> so I think we probably as rheumatologists could be doing a much better job. So we recently had our national conference and it was combined with the um, New Zealand uh, Rheumatology Association in Christchurch uh, about a month ago. And uh, one of my colleagues, um, this is a particular area of interest for her PhD, and she actually did a study that reported only about 30%, and this is adult rheumatologists, are routinely asking their female patients of childbearing years if they are using appropriate contraception for the medications they're on. 
uh, which I found quite interesting. And we did have a bit of a chuckle amongst all the paediatricians and we thought that probably the paediatric rheumatologists were probably worse at this than the adult rheumatologists. All right, so who do you talk to? Well, for all contraception, um, GPs are the best at this. So I am going out on a limb talking about different forms of or, um, hormonal contraception. Um, so your GP is your absolute first port of call, all right? Um, combine that with your rheumatologist and also understanding what your risk is on the particular medications that you're taking as well. For extra information, the Australian Rheumatology Association website has some really good information about um, pregnancy and your uh, medications, and it talks about specific medications that you may be on and whether or not they're safe and what to do if, you're, if you fall pregnant. I think the most important thing is, is that when uh, we're transitioning, we're in teenage years, young adults recognising that teenagers and, and young adults are sexually active or will be sexually active and there's no it's no good talking about it in retrospect so we need to plan ahead so um you know if you're a parent of a child with juvenile arthritis who's <clears throat> you know moving into their teenagers or early adulthood talking about this with them beforehand I think is really important taking them you know, with with yourself if they're comfortable, or on their own if they if they're comfortable with that, to your GP or the rheumatologist, and talking about their contraceptive options and what they need to do to manage their medications. So be prepared, and I think that is the key message. All right. So as I've touched on briefly before, this is not. No, you can never have a baby. You can certainly have a baby if you have juvenile arthritis and you can certainly have a baby if you have rheumatoid arthritis and other forms of arthritis. It's something, again, that is quite specific to your particular disease subtype and also how active or well-controlled your disease is on the medications you're on. You may need to plan in advance. So if I have a woman on methotrexate who tells me that she wants to have a baby, there are other medications that I will move her to um, <clears throat> and she will need to have sort of a washout period potentially of some of those other medications that she may have been on before she can start trying to have a baby. So thinking about it ahead, um, in the, uh, thinking about it early and planning and communicating is really important. We know certainly in rheumatoid arthritis that your fertility probably improves with better disease control. Okay, so sometimes we might be in the situation where a young woman might want to have a baby, but her disease is really not adequately controlled. So we might say, look, let's get your disease under control. You're still young. You've got time up your sleeve. Let's get it better controlled and then relook at this in six, 12 months, two years time, and, and we'll go from there. So <clears throat> as I said, your medications may do, mean to be adjusted, but it's something that we can work with and we can work around. You just need to talk to us. So men with juvenile arthritis or men with rheumatoid arthritis, they can father children, okay? There is some medications that may affect the quality of their sperm, but generally speaking, men can safely speak, keep taking most of the drugs that they may be prescribed um, it, if they're wanting to try and have children, okay? And that's sort of a shift in the information that was probably out there sort of, you know, 10, 20 plus years ago. Um, but, you know, there's uh, good data on this now and that information sheet on the ARA website goes through all of this quite clearly. We know that better treatments, okay, so getting you on the right treatment, getting your disease under control results in better outcomes for mum and babies, okay? So we can work around this. We're very well versed in working around having children, planning a family, um, planning pregnancies. We just need to know what you want to do. And I routinely ask my women of uh, childbearing ages what their plans are. Um, even, you know, I've had patients with, you know, they're in their sort of mid to late 30s and they've had eight children and their rheumatoids under control or, or maybe not under control. And I'll ask them, do you still want another? And 
one day someone said, yeah, I want another baby. I was like, okay, all right, well, let's plan this differently. Let's look at these medications instead of this. All right. So keeping the lines of communication open is really important. <clears throat> all right. So when we talk about moving into adolescence and young adulthood, alcohol is going to come up, isn't it? All right. So Strictly speaking, when we talk about methotrexate and the information sheets on the IRA website will say this, um, and also probably on the box, that you shouldn't drink alcohol and methotrexate at the same time. I think the reality is most of my patients probably do drink alcohol while they're on methotrexate, certainly my adults do. Some drink too much um, and do run into trouble, particularly if they've got other causes of underlying liver um, um, disease. Um, it's going to happen. We need to talk about it. We need to be open about it. Um, we need to not judge about it. But I think we need to inform our young people that, look, probably safe drinking, um, you know, I can't sort of say strictly speak, oh, one drink's okay, but certainly excessive drinking, binge drinking, which may also lead to risky behaviours such as um, sexual behaviours that may predispose to sexually transmitted infections, which can be a problem if you're immune suppressed on certain medications. So again, being open, communicating about alcohol. And if I have a young person or indeed an adult who we nut away the history and they're drinking too much to, um, I feel, to be safely on methotrexate, then we'll take it off. We'll, we'll remove the methotrexate and we'll look at other options for them. Obviously, counselling them that it's, there's other ways of reducing their alcohol intake or stopping it entirely, entirely, that would be preferable. But I get that, you know, that's not always possible for some people. So, again, talking about um, these issues, um, being um, open and communicating with your, your rheumatologist and your GP, and also, quite frankly, the rheumatologist who's also got to ask the question as well. All right. So what about smoking? So when I say smoking, I'm going to talk about cigarette smoking. And look, essentially, this is just bad, bad, bad. So um, we know that smoking cigarettes um, is a potential cause of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and we see that. We know that if you continue to smoke with a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, and if you're on um, your medications, your medications may not be as effective, okay? So you'll have potentially ongoing grumbling disease if you continue to smoke, all right? Smoking also increases your risk of other diseases, which can be compounded if your joint disease is not able to be well controlled, and it also increases your risk of infections. <laughs> so I think generally speaking, I would counsel all my young patients and adult patients Smoking is bad. Don't go down that route, okay? But again, there, the reality is there will be kids, young adults, teenagers and young people that will continue to smoke and have joint disease and be on these medications. And so it's all about managing that with them and, and giving them the support and the support measures around them to try and get them off, off smoking. All right, so what about vaping? So we had a, recent, a really interesting talk the other day at Campbelltown Hospital by a public health um, uh, specialist. So vaping is, you know, bigger than I ever realised. It's massive. Um, I don't tend to go to 21st anymore or 18th birthday parties, but I'm told that everyone is vaping. Um, we think, and certainly the information we received from this public health um, physician was that it's probably just as bad as smoking in as much that it can cause serious lung injury. Um, and uh, that's been well documented. We've seen cases of it in Australia that can cause rapid death um, or severe morbidity, so severe complications. And also, concerningly, vaping can often be a gateway to other drugs or cigarettes. So um, I think increasingly as rheumatologists and certainly amongst my colleagues and contemporaries, we are asking our patients if they're vaping, um, how they can go about stopping vaping and reducing certainly the amount of vaping that they're doing um, and trying to counsel them again and again support them through getting them off vaping as well. All right, so other drugs. So the short answer is we just don't know, okay? So I think if you're smoking um, 
cannabis, that's an infection risk. Um, people may smoke cannabis for various reasons. This is not really the topic of tonight's talk, but we've recently been reviewing the evidence for um, medicinal cannabis and cannabis in patients with non-cancerous musculoskeletal pain, um, and it probably is not um, any more effective than any other agents we have for reducing pain, and certainly it will not target the immune process that is driving juvenile arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. So we absolutely don't recommend it. Um, and it may cause other problems. So increasing drowsiness, problem, problems with driving or operating machinery. Um, it can also, obviously, if you're inhaling it, can increase your risk of chest infections. And then when we talk about other drugs like ecstasy or cocaine, um, the short answer is we just don't know how they will interact with our medications. Um, we, they're a great unknown. They're often combined with other things that um, you, you don't know. Um, rat poison, I think, is one of them. Um, laundry detergent. Um, they're just things that you don't want to be taking. So my advice is to strongly avoid any illicit drugs on the black market, whether they be prescription drugs or or, you know, um, made in a backyard lab or, or garage. Um, we don't know what's going on. If you are on treatment for juvenile arthritis, the reality is you are more prone to infections um, and complications. Just avoid it if you can. Well, no, definitely avoid it. You can avoid it. All right. So I think um, as we, you know, come to the end of the talk, I think, um, my key message, I think, is keep communicating with your team, with your treating team, whether that be your paediatric rheumatology team or your adult rheumatologist. Um, keep in contact, okay? If we, and, and unfortunately, you know, in a perfect world, I would be able to contact all my patients directly, but the reality is I've got thousands of patients and rheumatologists and paediatric rheumatologists, even more so perhaps across New South Wales, certainly, and Australia, um, have, you know, many, sorry, my phone's just ringing, um, many thousands of patients. So we can't always keep a direct contact and they go, oh, so-and-so didn't turn up for their six-month appointment. Unfortunately, I just won't remember. And often if you're being seen in private practice, there isn't a nurse to be chasing you. So I think... Um, keeping in contact, keeping your regular appointments, remembering that if you are on those more targeted um, immune suppressing medications that the government requires you to jump through a few hoops to obtain, you have to be seen by a rheumatologist within a 12 month period, or even if that drug's working, you may not ever get access to it again. Okay. And that's heartbreaking. And we often, you know, unfortunately, I've seen it before, young people, they were diagnosed with JIA, they were well treated with their paediatric rheumatologist, around about the age of 19, 20, they sort of disappeared because life took over, they were kind of just putting up with their joint pain, and then they end up in a mess by their mid to late 20s, and the drug that they were on, they never put in, um, they never put in a, uh, an application to Medicare, and so, unfortunately, they're, they're prevented from ever being on that medication again, even if it was effective. And it's heartbreaking and it's not how it should be, um, but it's because these medications and the costs of them, it's a limited resource and you need to be always demonstrating that you've had a response to them. Um, that's where those transition nurses and care teams really come into play in that tricky time um, when we're trying to keep track of our patients and make sure our young people don't fall through the cracks, okay? And I think the other thing to remember is we're there to help, okay, and support. We're not there to judge. We've all been there. We've all probably drunk too much alcohol. We may even have smoked some marijuana or cigarettes. Um, so even those boring grey doctors that you see that look like they haven't done anything fun for an awfully long time, we've all been there. We all know what it's like to be a young person, a young adult, and we're there to help. The last thing we want is people to have bad joint disease that results in lifelong disability and functional problems, okay? So keep in contact. Um, don't lose touch with us. 
we're all there to help, okay? So I guess in summary, um, are there any questions? There's one on the chat there that I can ask. Um, sorry, that's my son. I'll just delete him. I can, I can call him back. All right. All right. So, Mark, thank you. Um, so uh, just trying to see. How do I go back to that question that we had? Hang on. Did you want me? I can read it out too. Would that be? Oh, easy? there we go. Yeah. Do you want to read it out? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there was a question. So um, the poster asks, my family has four generations of RA. Um, a daughter and a niece have inflammatory arthritis. Granddaughter has been diagnosed with fibromyalgia recently. Does this make her more likely to suffer um, from inflammatory arthritis as her cousin mm -hmm. and aunt also have um, CFS and fibromyalgia accompanying their RA? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so Sandra, thanks for the question. So I can't really specifically talk about, I guess, too many specifics without sort of the information in front of me, such as blood results and imaging and physically examining um, your daughter. But my short answer would be no. Um, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia is not do, does not mean that you're at increased risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. Having said that, we do often see fibromyalgia or chronic pain sensitization in our patients with rheumatoid arthritis um, and other inflammatory arthritis. A rheumatologist um, sort of area, you know, probably the most important thing a rheumatologist does when they assess a patient um, is really try and nut out pain and identify and characterize the pain and break it down into components. And often, when people have had pain for a long time, that pain will change over time. Um, and, you know, what was initially, the, the pain that was initially presenting from rheumatoid arthritis, even though we treat the rheumatoid arthritis and that settles down, the patient can then go and develop pain associated with fibromyalgia. So a rheumatologist is really good at differentiating between those two different types of pain and, and therefore targeting the treatments appropriately. The short answer would be in your granddaughter, I would say no, um, she's not. Um, I would suggest that your cousin and aunt, um, if they have rheumatoid arthritis, then their um, that chronic pain potentially from that could predispose them to fibromyalgia um, or chronic pain sensitization. But certainly for your granddaughter, I wouldn't think that it's a, oh my gosh, she's going to get rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Um, you know, and I, I don't think that's the case. Are there any other questions? And if anyone did sort of want to, you know, have a, an anonymous question, you can sort of direct it directly to, <laughs> to myself or Amy in the in the chat um, as well. Or if you want to take your microphone off, you can, you, you're welcome to um, to ask anything as well. I mean, I, I didn't have any questions myself either, Amy. I think like Marg has said, um, I think it was very informative and, and a lot of things that um, we don't always think of um, with um, arthritis generally in, in the adult population as well, definitely a lot more considerations and things we need to be remembering to, to ask as, as parents and, and rheumatologists as, as well and have those conversations. Um, yeah, look, I think, I think just keeping the lines of communication yeah. open is really important. Keeping in touch don't lose touch with us. And also, sometimes we encounter this, don't think you're going to offend us if you want to see another rheumatologist, mm -hmm. okay? There's so much, so many um, rheumatology patients out there, no one is looking for a lot of work, okay? <laughs> you know, I mean, we've got a lot of work as it is, which is fabulous, um, but don't think we're offended if you go and see someone else. The reality is there are people you will gel with and there are people you will not gel with. Um, and if you're not gelling with someone, then go and see someone else. And I think that's really important to tell our yeah. young people as well that, you know, if the scary guy in the grey suit, they're not comfortable talking about, well, yes, I'm having sex and I may need to be on an oral contraceptive pill because I'm on methotrexate, that's totally fine, okay? Find someone who you would be comfortable having that conversation with. I know that also is fairy tale stuff because there's, it's not easy to get into a rheumatologist. It's difficult in the public clinic setting. I get that. 
But, you know, please don't don't feel that once you're with a rheumatologist, you have to keep seeing that one. You know, none of us are offended if you see someone else. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important that it's not just about, you know, a rheumatologist that you think is, is generally good and, and giving good information, but it's also around the the relationship and, and how you interact with them. That's also so important in, in finding a, a good rheumatologist or any health professional, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. I think that's everything. It doesn't look like we've got any questions. So thank you again, Amy, so much. Um, very informative. We're, we're so grateful for your your time to come and speak with us tonight and, and educate us all more on um, juvenile arthritis and, and the transition into to adulthood and, and young adults as well. Um, yeah, thank, thank you so much and, and enjoy your night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, everyone. Bye. I'll stop the recording.